Welcome to the Brethren of the Morning Star. I'm your host, Magister Cankerworm. In our previous and premier episode, we explored the bare bones of diabolism. That episode was particularly Satan-centric. In this follow-up, I would like to dig into the theology of diabolism, as understood by the Brethren, in a way that sheds further light on the goddess Lilith. The essay that follows is a slight adaptation to the epilogue of our unfinished commentary on the nine gates of the kingdom of shadows, which is entitled The Road to Babylon. While that commentary is still being developed, the current draft is available for download at brethrenofthemorningstar.com. The nine gates, of course, come to us from the novel The Club Dumas, which was later adapted into the film The Ninth Gate. The Brethren of the Morning Star make use of the images associated with the various gates in our spiritual practices. We also have a motto meant to encapsulate the wisdom of those gates. A light appears in the darkness, but heed my warning. The path is long and uncertain. There is no turning back. No expense may be spared. You must overcome your fears and delusions and lay claim to a terrible strength. Then you may unlock what is closed and enter the gates of Babylon. For individuals first encountering this motto, or the brethren of the Morning Star more generally, one question is likely to arise. Who or what is exactly meant by Babylon? A number of passages in our commentary to the nine gates of the kingdom of shadows state clearly that Babylon exists when and wherever an individual diabolist embodies their law in the way they live. Clearly, then, Babylon is not here referring to a geopolitical entity that formerly existed in the ancient world in what is now modern-day Iraq. It is an ethos, a state of mind and way of life. Passages in the Book of Infernal Prayer, however, imply that Babylon is a title describing Lilith. The psalm entitled Babylon is very explicit in this. Sing unto me, for I am Lilith, the mistress of the people, the most awe-inspiring of goddesses, Lilith says. Sing unto me, for I am Babylon, the bride of hell. So which is it? Is Babylon a state of mind or an appellation of Lilith's? The answer is both, though we will need to look at how Babylon has been used mythologically in the past to understand this fully. Babylon in Jewish Scripture The first mention of Babylon occurs in Genesis with the attempted construction of the Tower of Babel. Though this story references the very real ziggurat that once stood in the ancient city, the authors of Genesis use this building to tell a story about Jehovah's reaction to humanity's increasing technological prowess. Now the whole earth had one language and few words, and as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 
Revised Standard Version. The story of Babel explains not only why the languages and customs of the people of the earth are so different from one another, but is a warning for generations to come. Any attempt by humanity to establish a name for themselves that is not explicitly ordained by Jehovah will be punished severely. Humanity, it seems, is capable of thwarting Jehovah's designs, and the jealous God is quick to prevent that from happening. By the time of the prophets, Babylon is a powerful empire, which, according to Jewish scripture, Jehovah would soon use to punish Judah and the city of Jerusalem in particular for the Israelite failure to remain faithful to the Mosaic Covenant. The fulfillment of this prophecy is recorded perhaps most poignantly in the book of Jeremiah. The Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple built by Solomon, and carry many of the Israelite people off to Babylon as captives of war. These events create a rupture in the Jewish psyche, the bitterness of the people who now found themselves in Babylon is recorded bluntly in Psalm 136. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, Raise it, raise it, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall he be who requites you with what you have done to us. Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. From the Revised Standard Version. It is difficult to overestimate the effect this Babylonian captivity had on the later Jewish faith. The chosen people had been defeated and humiliated, and the house of their God Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, lay in ruins. How had this happened? Why had the Lord failed to fulfill his promises that the royal line of King David would never fall? Many scholars believe that much of the Tanakh which Christians refer to as the Old Testament, was written or edited either in light of this catastrophe or with its shadow hanging over it. Babylon in Christian Scripture Though the Babylonians would be conquered by the Persians and many of the displaced Jews allowed to return to their former homeland, the memory of the defeat at the hands of Babylon would live painfully on. By the time Jesus showed up on the scene, Babylon had become a byword for the various forces who opposed Jehovah's will. The Apostle Peter ends the first of his epistles with the statement that she who is in Babylon greets the Christ followers reading the letter. Peter and his community were not actually in Babylon. The city was little more than a ruined village at this point in history. They were in the Roman Empire which for many Jews, followers of the Nazarene or not, was another manifestation of the spirit of Babylon. That is, any force that sought to thwart or destroy Jehovah's kingdom on earth. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the Revelation, where the author describes Babylon not as an empire, but a scandalous, scarlet-clad woman riding atop a fearsome beast with seven heads. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman setting on a scarlet beast 
which was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and bedecked with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 5 Revised Standard Version. Christians have never agreed upon what the whore of Babylon, and most of the images in Revelation for that matter, symbolize. While identifying Babylon with Imperial Rome is currently the most favored scholarly interpretation, other explanations have historically waxed and waned in popularity. Preterist theologians, who contend that the Revelation was pr written prior to 70 CE, see her as being symbolic of Jerusalem, which was soon to be destroyed. The Reformers saw it as being the Catholic Church. Some denominations see it as symbolizing the fallen state of the Church in general, not just Roman Catholicism. For our purposes, Babylon represents any culture, government, person, or power that seduces Jehovah's faithful away from his worship. Babylon is a spirit of being which may manifest under different names and guises throughout history, but whose essence remains the same. In this way, Babylon is the antithesis of Jerusalem or Zion, which is emblematic of Jehovah's rule on earth. The dichotomy between these two cities is laid out explicitly by St. Augustine in his Exposition on Psalm 65. And see ye the names of those two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon is interpreted confusion, Jerusalem vision of peace. Observe now the city of confusion, in order that you may perceive the vision of peace, that you may endure that sigh for this, whereby can those two cities be distinguished? Can we anywise now separate them from each other? They are mingled, and from the very beginning of mankind, mingled they run on unto the end of the world. Jerusalem received, beginning through Abel, Babylon through Cain. For the buildings of the cities were afterwards erected. That Jerusalem and the land of the Jebusites was built, for at first it used to be called Jabus. From thence the nation of the Jebusites was expelled, when the people of God was delivered from Egypt and led into the land of promise. Babylon was built in the most interior regions of Persia, which for a long time raised its head above the rest of nations. These two cities then at particular times were built, so that there might be shown a figure of two cities begun of old and to remain even unto the end in this world, but at the end to be severed. Whereby then can we now show them that are mingled? At that time the Lord shall show, when some he shall set on the right hand, others on the left. Jerusalem on the right hand shall be, Babylon on the left. Two loves make up these two cities. Love of God makes Jerusalem. Love of the world makes Babylon. Therefore, let each one question himself as to what he loves, and he shall find of which he is a citizen. And if he shall have found himself to be a citizen of Babylon, let him root out cupidity, implant charity. But if he shall have found himself a citizen of Jerusalem, let him endure captivity, hope for liberty. Now, therefore, let us hear of, brethren, hear of and sing of and long for that city whereof we are citizens. Citizenship in either of these two cities is a metaphor for where your allegiances lie, with the Abrahamic God or the devil. And just as the New Jerusalem is sometimes poetically described as the Bride of Christ, so Babylon is epitomized by Lilith, the Bride of Satan. Babylon, 
Babylon, and Thelema. The cosmology of Aleister Crowley's Liber al Valegis, the founding document of Thelema, divides the universe into two interrelated forces. Nuit, goddess of the sky, who could be described as an infinite mathematical field, and Hadit, who, as a mathematical point, plays the yang to Nuit's yin. Crowley would later go on to explain, however, that Nuit and Hadit each have a secret name and identity, Babylon and Chaos, respectively. While Crowley would borrow from the language of the New Testament and his descriptions of Babylon, describing her as the mother of abominations and the Scarlet Woman, his understanding of her is much different from that of the historical church. For Crowley, Babylon is Mother Earth herself, an archetype of female sexuality in general, as well as what he called the gateway to the city of pyramids. This last title will likely need some explanation. According to Crowley's system of mystical attainment, the final and most dangerous threshold a spiritual seeker must face is crossing the abyss, that is, navigating the space that seemingly lies between Sephira of Hesed and Bina on the Kabbalistic tree of life. The abyss separates the supernal realms of the heavens, wherein dwells the divine, and the material world below. The magician who successfully crosses the abyss is confronted with a choice. Pour their entire ego and identity into Babylon so that they may be reborn in the city of pyramids, as a master of the temple, or cling to their ego, at which point they will fall down the tree and become what Crowley describes as a black brother. While many Thelemites take Crowley at face value on this, understanding the capstone of their system to be dissolution into the divine godhead that is the universe, Satanists have had their doubts. Of the grade of Adeptus Exemptus, in Crowley's system, Anton LaVey wrote in The Satanic Rituals on Crossing the Abyss, Crowley, nobody's fool, simply set up a magical maze so that students whose consciences would only allow them to tread the right-hand path would nevertheless wind up on the left. Fortunately, precious few of Crowley's disciples progressed as far as the grade of Adeptus Exemptus thus neatly preventing problems that might have arisen from such rude spiritual awakenings. While former Church of Satan magister Michael Aquino wrote, I agree with Anton that, under Crowley's system, it is a conceptual impossibility for an individual to deliberately cross the abyss to merge with the Godhead while yet retaining self-consciousness. One cannot have one's cake and eat it too. I would say that Crowley succeeded in crossing the abyss, but that none of his students were able to do likewise, and that Crowley's actual state of magical being beyond the abyss was other than he assumed it to be. Be that as it may, Babylon is a popular, if not the most popular, goddess in Thelema. She is the creatrix, giving birth to all souls, and the gate which all souls must pass through on their way back into the divine. Crowley interpreted her title of whore to mean that while she refuses none, there is nonetheless a heavy price to pay to join one's self to her. The image of Babylon being both matronly, albeit in a rather ferocious way, and sexually liberated, was developed further by Jack Parsons, who attempted to ritually contact Babylon in the late 1940s. The assistant to these rituals was none other than future founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard. One of the results of these magical workings was what Parsons called Liber 49, which functions as an unofficial fourth chapter to Crowley's Liber al Valegis. The speaker of Liber 49 is Babylon herself, who foretells that she will soon come in the flesh to mankind. She will bring with her, 
a resurgence of witchcraft, sexual liberty, and artistic freedom, gathering all the forces of the Antichrist to her. Babylon in Diabolism We have seen above in Christianity and Thelema two differing but related visions of who or what Babylon is. To the former, Babylon is code for the forces and opposition to Jehovah's, or any other gods, attempt to become Lord of all creation. In the latter, Babylon is a representation of the feminine forces of existence, playing the yin to chaos's yang, who nevertheless may be embodied by particular individuals on earth. Our conception of Babylon, at least within the Brethren of the Morning Star, is closer to that of Christianity's, though it is certainly colored by ideas in Thelema, Parsons' work in particular. For the Diabolist, Babylon is the spiritual realm of hell made manifest on earth. It is not a literal city. Diabolists will not be fighting for its control the way the Abrahamic faiths have historically over Jerusalem. To seek entrance into Babylon is to seek to actualize the latent demonic potential within oneself and the culture around you. To live a life of liberty and self-determination, knowing no law beyond the law that is written upon your own heart, fighting the forces of homogeneity or manipulating them for your own purposes, is to walk her streets and know her as your home. The ultimate example of Babylon made manifest is Lilith. Her fall Escape from Eden, self-sufficiency, and satanic gnosis is a road map for the infernal seeker, who likewise aims to nurture the demonic seed within themselves. To say that Lilith is a road map for the seeker in no way implies that the diabolist should force their personality to conform to Lilith's own. While all disciples of Satan should be in some sense proud, self-possessed, and self-assured. That doesn't mean that all need to be as intense as Lilith is in their antagonism toward Jehovah, nor that their libido must be as high-charged as her own. To put it another way, you don't have to be as in-your-face, in your demeanor, as our goddess can sometimes be. You are you. Lilith is Lilith. Manifest the qualities of her spirit, yes, but do so with the creativity of a true individual, not the mimicry of an empty vessel. For as heaven sought to keep Lilith ignorant of her divine heritage, so there are forces, spiritual and mundane, which seek to deform us into their own likeness. When we begin the hard work of discovering and determining our own course, opposing all that would turn us aside, we follow the way Lilith has modeled for us. The result of all this is that we are drawn ever closer to her groom, our Lord Satan, and like Lilith, who conceived the spirit of Antichrist, which burns like a black star within us, we too possess the potential to bear Satan's fruit into the world. Babylon is our home. Babylon is the devil's house, which we have been tasked to build. Babylon is for all those who have sought. Babylon is for all those who have been marked. Her streets are wide and hold multitudes. Come into her, all you that pursue the treasure of darkness. Come into her, all you who seek the demonic law within. Come into her, all you that have had enough of slavishness and the gray, wan world bequeathed to us by the Nazarene. Come into her, all you that would live deliciously. Fill her temple with gold and silver and precious stones, with pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and fine wood, and all manner of vessels of ivory and precious stone, with brass and iron and marble, with cinnamon and pleasant odors, ointment and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, beasts and sheep and horses, chariots and slaves, and all manner of human souls. Come into her, 
my brethren, so that you may partake of her delicacies and sins. I want to thank you all for joining me in this episode. I look forward to seeing you in the next. This is Magister Cankerworm. Ave Satanas, Ave Lilith.